In three years, Cyberdyne will become the largest supplier of military computer systems. All stealth bombers are upgraded with Cyberdyne computers becoming fully unmanned. Afterwards, they fly with a perfect operational record. The Skynet funding bill is passed. The system goes online on August 4, 1997. Human decisions are removed from strategic defense. Skynet begins to learn at a geometric rate. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time, August 29th. In a panic, they try to pull the plug. Well, thank goodness that didn't happen. Think you know what artificial intelligence is and how it applies to military aviation? This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, U.S. Air Force Colonel Randall Gordon, Vice Commander of the 412th Test Wing at Edwards Air Force Base, California, joins us to explain exactly this. And sorry, but you sci-fi fans, well, you may be disappointed. There's so much baggage associated with the term artificial intelligence. To be artificially intelligent, does that mean that the machine is cognizant? Does it have a soul? Is it self-aware? All those sorts of terms that kind of come along with it. What artificial intelligence truly is, stats, if you will, the way that we were taught stats in math class, but just done on a gigantic scale with large amounts of data sets and incredible compute power. But it's not what you see necessarily on TVs and movies, right? It's, it's a very, very different kind of world. So in your private life, you're very used to the world of artificial intelligence. You just don't call it that. You call it Netflix. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to episode 139 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Jello, and we have a really intriguing discussion on artificial intelligence and military aviation coming up. And it's not with me. Ken Katz is going to host this one, and he'll be along shortly to explain a little bit more about that. But before he does, a couple quick announcements and a listener question. Hope everyone's doing well. We are deep into spring here in San Diego and enjoying the beautiful weather. And I just want to give a shout out to Arnie. He's a listener from Montana who I met up in Northern California over the Easter weekend. He invited me up for something they do every year. And while we were there, I brought my 14-year-old son along who got to go fly fishing with me for the first time. And we went to the Red Bluff Rodeo, which was cool. Haven't been to a rodeo in a long time. And big shout out to VMFAT 101 from Miramar, who did the flyby. A division of F-18s came by, and then they all showed up at the rodeo afterwards and said hello to everybody. That was really cool. Nice work. And thanks again, Arnie. Great weekend, and enjoyed meeting all your friends. Anyway, last week's OV-10 Bronco episode was, I think, a big hit. Sounds like everyone enjoyed it, and what an intriguing aircraft. I did get some feedback. A couple different folks mentioned different things. One was Ralph Taylor, who volunteers at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. And he and some others said, uh, yeah, the 2.75-inch rocket was once called Mighty Mouse. And then he sent me a picture of something on display there at that museum. And it said it was due to their small size but powerful destructive potential. And if you remember that cartoon from way back, then that seems to uh, jive with that character. Now, Matt Cochran sent me a video of an OV-10 dropping paratroopers out the back of the aircraft from the 1994 Dobbins Air Show in Georgia. So indeed, I'm not crazy. Matt took that video when he was a young man, and others have said, yeah, they saw it at El Toro as well. And then yet other listeners sent links to various articles. I think one was from We Are the Mighty about Broncos on aircraft carriers and amphibious ships back in the day. So anyway, always appreciate the feedback from everyone. And again, I thought that was a fun episode. Well, we got a little bit more sadness here in the Aiello household just this past week. My aunt Biba passed away in Denmark. She was in her early 80s and had been suffering from some health issues, but it came a little faster than we'd all hoped. My mother did not get back to see her sister before she passed. So we're really uh, sad about that. And um, big shout out, of course, to everyone there in Denmark in the family who is dealing with that. And obviously let me know if you're going to have some sort of celebration. Maybe hopefully I can get over there. All right. Our listener question is from Rich Goyette. He is from Boston, Massachusetts. And he says, I've been going through old episodes and recently re-listened to the first happy hour episode with Hammer. 
And you might remember, listeners, that uh, Happy Hour is a Patreon perk. And it's fact, it's how we got the uh, Dale Bourbon interview for a couple episodes back on the Day Carrier Landings Part 3. Anyway, Rich continues, he makes several references to flying the A-4 and the F-16 with the, quote, aggressors, but he also says that it was not at Top Gun. I'm not familiar with Navy aggressors. How is this different from Top Gun? Well, that's a good question, Rich. So remember, Top Gun is a school, and the school incorporates and uses adversaries, and they have some of their own. Now, adversary squadrons exist separate from Top Gun, and there are still many today, at least in the Navy and the Marine Corps. You've got VFC-12 in Oceana, VFC-13 in Fallon, VFC-111 in Key West, VMFT-401 in Yuma. And in fact, some of the pilots at those commands are Top Gun graduates, but it's a different situation because Top Gun teaches the Top Gun course, duh. And these VFCs and VMFT squadrons, well, they do other things. They do fleet training, they do unit level upgrades, they do SFARPs, they help out with Air Wing Fallon. So it's different, but they do use Top Gun graduates and Top Gun tactics in the things they do. So yeah, I thought that was a good question. I don't know how that's different in the Air Force, but that's how they do it in the Navy and the Marine Corps. All right, well, that was my one and only listener question for this week. Now let's roll into the feature interview on artificial intelligence in military aviation. And this one, once again, features our buddy Ken Katz, who joins us again. How's it going, Primetime? Hi, Jello. Great to be back on Fighter Pilot Podcast. Oh, good. Well, we're always glad to have you back. So it's been a little while. We'll get caught up with you afterwards. But as we just promised everyone, let's go ahead and jump into this interview. And man, it's a really good one. What do you think? Well, I discovered a YouTube video in which Laz taught a class about flight controls at MIT. And uh, he's a great teacher. And since we both have Edwards Air Force Base and MIT in common, I knew this was a guy I wanted to talk to. I learned so much in this interview. My big takeaway is that artificial intelligence or AI is going to be really important in the future of military aviation, but it's not some kind of magic. Oh, I totally agree. So why don't we turn over the microphone to him? Here we go. Artificial intelligence is at the cutting edge of technology. Today, we will discuss this technology with Colonel Randall Gordon, experimental test pilot, 412th Test Wing Vice Commander at Edwards Air Force Base, and a leading expert on artificial intelligence within the U.S. Air Force. Welcome, Colonel Gordon. Hey, Ken. How are you doing today? Doing well. We'd like to start off these interviews by having you tell us a little about yourself. How'd you get to where you are now? What was your commissioning source and education and operational and technical background? Yeah, so I like to tell people I've had a bit of a Forrest Gump kind of Air Force career because it doesn't make any sense even to me and I lived it. So hang with me here. It's proof positive that if you hang around long enough, you can get lucky and end up with something really amazing. So, you know, I grew up in upstate New York, a very, very small town outside of West Point, believe it or not, the military academy. Didn't want to go to West Point because, quite frankly, it was too close to home, right? Nothing against West Point. I just, I'd seen it. I'd been in that area for a long time. And I was really interested in going off to something a little bit different. And so I knew I wanted to join the military. I was pretty hardcore about flying airplanes. And so the Air Force Academy just seemed to make a lot of sense to go do. So I took off, went to go do that, went out from there with an aeronautical engineering degree, and then immediately went off to pilot training, which kind of kicked off just a, a pretty grateful, if you will, series of events that have happened with respect to my flying career. I was initially an F-15C fighter pilot in the beautiful state of Alaska. Went from there to test pilot school and did grad school in route. As a test pilot, it's been F-15Cs, F-15Es, the A-10 Warthog, the Global Express BD-700, F-22 Raptor, and then now the F-16, you know, here is the Vice Wing. A couple of things that have happened in between there along the way. I got a chance to do some initial cadre work with AFWorks, our innovation team for the Secretary of the Air Force. And then that kind of spun off into a career setting up the Artificial Intelligence Accelerator as the initial director with MIT. Uh, did a couple of fellowships along the way, one at Harvard, one at uh, Presidential Leadership Scholars. So I got a chance to be a presidential fellow there, and then got a PhD through the uh, School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. So it's been a, um, a bizarre career that's taken twists and turns along the way, but it's been one that's been really fun, uh, part of my Air Force story, if you will. Wow, a lot of interesting things. And now you're the uh, wing vice commander at Edwards. You bet. Yeah, so I've been serving here for about uh, two years, and then I'll be heading out to be the wing commander at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex in Tennessee. 
So let's jump into artificial intelligence here. And I guess the first question that I have is what is artificial intelligence? Because we use words like smart bombs, but I don't think that we would say that a paveway laser guided bomb is actually artificially intelligent. So what is artificial intelligence? Yeah, so I spent a lot of time with my MIT guys kind of going over this exact question because it taught me that words really matter. And there's so much baggage associated with the term artificial intelligence. It's actually a term that began back in the 1950s. And it was the notion of, can we get computers to do things that humans kind of naturally do? It's not a new term, but it does come with a lot of stereotypes that have been associated with it. Like in other words, to be artificially intelligent, does that mean that the machine is cognizant? Does it have a soul? Is it self-aware? All those sorts of terms that kind of come along with it. Truly and honestly, in reality, what artificial intelligence truly is, is stats, if you will, the way that we were taught stats in math class, but just done on a gigantic scale with large amounts of data sets and incredible compute power, honestly brought about by the video game industry with graphical processing units. So the explosion of data kind of combined with compute power has now allowed essentially an advanced version of statistics, but it's essentially statistics. Is the machine cognizant? You know, is it self-aware in the way that you kind of see in science fiction movies? Absolutely not, right? It is a very, very different world than what you see in science fiction. But what it is able to do is that for very well-bounded kind of problems, it's able to digest incredible amounts of data to be able to produce usable information relatively quickly. But it's not what you see necessarily on TVs and movies, right? It's a very, very different kind of world. So if a laser-guided bomb is not, even though we call it a smart bomb, is not actually artificially intelligent, let's take a global hawk that has a automated return to home mode if it loses its data link. Is that considered artificial intelligence? You can consider it a very limited kind of set of it. And that's why I'm saying the words really, really matter here in terms of what it kind of conjures up in people's minds. If it's a, what we call an expert system. So in other words, if it's something that we've routinely done over and over and over again, and I have a gigantic amount of data behind it, and I can quote unquote, teach a system to recognize what it needs to do. If I present it some new piece of data, that's where we're starting to get into the world. Like you'll hear things like neural networks or whatever. It's just the method that it uses to actually get there. But in reality, what you're talking about is I pre-program something, right? If I lose link for, for instance, you know, and drones do this a lot of places. If I lose link, it knows home is over this direction, turn around, go back that way and fly a predefined profile to get you back all the way home. What we're typically talking about, like the work that we did specifically with like MIT, it was sort of like the next step beyond the standard, is it a cat or is it a dog? The image recognition kind of problem set where I have gigantic data sets And I have a human being that says, I know that's a cat and I know that's a dog, but can I feed this forward through a neural network and see what the computer says? And if it's wrong, then I attach a certain value score to that, refeed it back into the machine until it eventually produces the result that I already know the answer to. And when I get enough statistical confidence that it is getting the right answer about cat or dog, then I can, you know, let it kind of go on its own. It can be a very brute forcey kind of method using big data sets with which to help a machine ultimately recognize something such that if I give it a picture of something it's never seen before, it will compare it to what I've already taught it and try to figure out if it's a cat or a dog. That's where you start getting a little bit more into what people normally think about in terms of artificial intelligence. Let's talk about types of artificial intelligence because you've used some words like machine learning and neural networks. What are these things and how do they work? Artificial intelligence, machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of this larger umbrella called artificial intelligence. And it gets into these different techniques that we use to teach a machine how to go about it, right? We talked a little bit about expert systems or, you know, trying to give it some information that we know at the beginning and we know what the answer is at the end. That's kind of what we get into when we talk about machine learning. A neural network, and again, when words matter, right? And so when we think neural... We automatically think about the brain and we think about neural networks that are inside the brain and how dendrites and axons can communicate with one another to be able to produce a signal of energy as it goes through. So imagine, you know, like the standard depiction you see of neural networks, which are all these nodes all kind of connected together. Each one of those nodes is an input where 
it is able to sum up information from various nodes and it goes to the next node and it feeds forward that network. And then at the end of the day, if I give it a picture of a cat, it's really not seeing a cat in the same way that you and I would see a cat. It looks at pixels if we're talking about an image recognition problem in artificial intelligence, but it's looking at pixels and it's trying to make a judgment call about, well, all the things that you've shown me, all cats have this type of shape that looks like an ear, right? Uh, you know, this pixel has this density of light or dark or whatever. And you feed that forward all the way through these different networks. And at the very end, it produces a simple answer and it says, yes, it's a cat or no, it's not a cat. And then it gives it a certain statistical confidence on the back end of it. The uh, neural network, it's a method, right? It's a technique that we use to be able to digest large amounts of information Again, when you use the term neural network, you kind of think that it's looking at a cat and it understands what a cat is. It really, really doesn't. It's really just looking at the qualities of the pixels that you give it. And over time, it eventually is able to come up with, well, you've told me this is a cat enough times. So therefore, if I see things like this, I'm going to say that it's a cat once it gets all the way through the uh, neural network. So if we're talking about dogs and cats, but I assume that this could also be used, let's say, for an ISR system to distinguish between Abrams tanks and T-80 tanks. Yeah, that's the holy grail. Very, very difficult to do. Because again, you can imagine so much of that depends on the lighting, the shape of it all. There's a classic story, and this gets a little bit into the ethics of AI and the fact that essentially the AI itself will pick up the biases of whatever the person taught it right to go do. So if we tell it that all cars have four tires and we feed it images of cars and they all have four wheels, and then one day we show it, you know, a vehicle that has, you know, like some of the big trucks that's got six tires on it or more. Now it's looking at something that perhaps it doesn't fully recognize. And chances are, it might not actually say that that's a car because everything that we fed it beforehand says car. It gets into the difficulties of using machines to be able to process information that is new or novel or unique and isn't a very robust and very well understood data set. Again, this gets to the rhetoric, vice the reality of what AI can and can't do. But to your point, that's one of the challenges that we have with this. So specifically, when we're looking at the Air Force and artificial intelligence, what is the Air Force uh, doing in this area? The SECAF and the chief of staff of the Air Force have been very, very clear that we must transition the Air Force to more of this digital Air Force. What we used to talk about all the time at MIT, and th- you know, this is something that people, I think, intuitively understand. When you go home at night and you're talking on Netflix or you're doing Spotify or any of those classic kind of streaming services, there's actually an AI algorithm that's running behind that. Just like we talked about, about is it a cat or is it a dog? You can break down songs or movies into discrete data points that a machine can understand. So you would say, hey, the music is rock and it's got this tempo and it involves these instruments and it's this artist and it was produced at this time or whatever. Over time, if it notices, hey, you tend to like these types of songs and you tend to like these types of movies, when you log into those systems, it starts suggesting things for you. So when those types of services came on board, I actually really enjoyed using them because I found that I could discover music and I could discover movies that I had no idea I liked, but it's because it looked and it saw all these other kind of characteristics and it started suggesting things that it knew that I might already like, right? Based on the preference for that. So in your private life, you're very used to the world of artificial intelligence. You just don't call it that. You call it Netflix, right? But in the world of the government and military, we've always kind of been in this world of, oh, that's decades away and you know we'll never quite get there and it's a very different world. And it's really kind of interesting to me personally because I go, hey, in my personal life, it's just a fact of life, right? We're just very used to AI. In the government, we're stuck in this world of thinking it's going to be somewhere out in the future. I think that's what the chief and the SECAF were getting at about, hey, the uh, world is digital. People get wrapped around the axle about, hey, there's an AI for anything. It'll fix anything. Whatever it is, just put an AI on it and it'll go that way. That's not really true. There are certain things, however, that AI is particularly good at that are bounded problem sets that we don't necessarily need a human to go do that. And so how do we go about giving airmen back their time, increasing the capability of airmen and making the force truly digital 
in the same way that in your private life, you're just very used to digital things. But somehow when you put on a uniform, you have to regress back in time two decades to a time when that wasn't really there. That's what I think they were getting at. And so when the Air Force is saying, hey, what are we going to do with AI? There's a whole host of things that would be great kind of problem sets for artificial intelligence that don't necessarily wrap around fighter jets and a whole bunch of other things. Now, a question. When most traditional Air Force systems, when you want to test them, you want to determine a parameter like, let's say, excess specific power or the range of a radar or the accuracy of a weapon, it's either highly deterministic or it's probabilistic, but in a fairly bounded way that we have techniques to measure. For something like artificial intelligence, it seems to me that that's a whole nother thing to test. It's neither deterministic nor probabilistic in the traditional sense, like dropping a bunch of bombs and calculating a circular error probable. So how do you test artificially intelligent systems? Yeah. And so again, Ken, your intuition is spot on. This is the joy of being in the world of flight test is really wrestling with problems like this. And problems by a bad word. Challenges is probably a better word. The whole spot of flight test, the way it was taught to me was always predict, test, and then validate, right? Those are the standard words. I'm sure you're probably very familiar with that from your background as well. Having a platform where we can do that and to do that in a safe environment where there are boundaries set left and right so that if the machine determines that it thinks it's a dog when in reality it's a cat, that you can observe that And then to be able to put safety boundaries around that so that it doesn't actually start processing the wrong way. That's kind of a lot of the work that we're really starting to get into a lot at Edwards, which is how do we have a safe platform, a test bed, kind of like in the way that we did with the F-16 with its variable in-flight stability system, where you could make it fly like a whole bunch of different airplanes, but if it went too far, it would disconnect that and revert it back to the F-16 flight control system. Building systems like that, I'm actually leveraging a lot of the work that you know Vista has already kind of done on that. Is kind of like one of the big kind of frontiers, if you will, of flight test of how do we do that with a platform that is safe, allows us to see what the AI is actually processing, but to also monitor what its decisions are, quote unquote decisions, and to be able to have safety boundaries around that. What you're getting at is one of the things that we worked on at MIT, and it was called trustable AI. We thought about it a lot in terms of like the classic joke we gave is if for whatever reason we see some strategic event happen in the world and we're using a machine to be able to process incredible amounts of data. And at the end of it, it says, well, if you want to prevent X, Y, or Z from happening, that you have to go stage an opera somewhere in Prague. How do we trust it, right? How do we trust that it arrived at the decision? Where's the traceability but behind that to say that if I want to prevent X, Y, or Z strategic event from happening, that the way to do that is to stage an opera somewhere in Prague. That was one of the kind of the vignette kind of questions that we wrestled with a lot at MIT, which was having this trustable sense of AI of it wants to go do something, but how do you know it actually arrived at the decision and how do you trust that the answer it arrived at is correct? Thinking about the potential applications of artificial intelligence within military aviation, can you give some potential use cases of how artificial intelligence might map into Air Force missions like air dominance or power projection, global mobility, ISR? What are some of the specific use cases that we're thinking about? Obviously, not straying into classified realms. Not completely. You know, what I would challenge you with is that you can actually even expand up even beyond just the standard stuff that we're talking about. One of the projects that we did in the world of aviation seems so mundane and so boring, but if we could actually solve it, it would make a huge difference. And that's in the world of scheduling, which every aviator completely understands of trying to schedule an airplane or trying to schedule air crew for that airplane or what's going to get loaded on that airplane or whatever. We have people that we call schedulers that take years and years and years to just develop a natural intuition for this sort of thing. And they're really, really good. But then that person retires or moves on to something different. And all of that corporate knowledge walks out the door with that person. And then you have to train up. It's almost like an apprenticeship to build like a Jedi Knight class scheduler. You know, you and I both know that without them, everything else that we talk about in terms of launching and recovering airplanes and being able to get effective missions, that kind of goes out the window unless you've got really, really good schedulers. 
That's a bounded problem with a tremendous amount of data because we keep all of our schedules digitally that we have worked a lot with various units across the Air Force to actually bring AI to the world of scheduling, kind of in the same way that uh, we were talking about earlier about using AI in the world of you know movies or music and that sort of thing. So even some of the most mundane basic stuff, even before you get to some of the more exquisite stuff, there's all types of applications for the world of artificial intelligence there. Broadly speaking, in terms of what you're talking about, there have been a couple of things that, you know, potential, right, good applications for it. One is, I think every fighter pilot's kind of had this experience somewhere along the way, which is I've looked through the heads up displays of many, many a different fighter. And depending on how overtasked and burdened I was in that particular moment, I've looked and it's hard for me to actually interpret what the heads up display is telling me because I'm overburdened, right? Everyone's been there. Radios are busy. It's very high environment, very dynamic, moving kind of thing. All of your displays that are sitting in front of you. They don't know that. They continue to display information, and sometimes it can become a bit of an overload, and suddenly you find yourself task-saturated. You miss things, mainly because you just have to load shed. Your brain will load shed that off of it. One of the projects that we looked at specifically was, hey, can I look at, like for instance, in pilot training is a classic example where overload kind of happens. Is there a way for the machine to recognize certain physiological characteristics of the human, whether, you know, where my eyeballs are moving, perspiration rates, those sorts of things, breathing rates, and recognize that the human is starting to get a bit overburdened and to be able to either gracefully degrade the displays to only show the most critical information or to be able to help kind of take over some of the more mundane tasks so that you are no longer load it up with that as a human and you can load shed that off and then be able to kind of think about and process the most important, most critical information along the way. We've taken some very rudimentary steps in that kind of direction, but that's one aspect of it. You know, to your point, the holy grail of ISR is the image recognition problem, which is very, very, very hard. Because again, not all tanks are shaped the same. Not all trucks are shaped the same. Lighting's different. Sometimes there's trees or, you know, whatever else in the background. I mean, that's very hard to do for like a weapons systems officer that's sitting in the back of a strike Eagle or a B one to go do that. That's very, very hard, you know, to be able to kind of develop that skill set. Again, it's another artisan craft, if you will, to be able to pick out which pixel is the important pixel that you care about and which one's not. That's a frontier that would be interested in terms of kind of going down that road as well. There are a number of things to get after from the most mundane thing like scheduling to a better human machine interface in the airplane itself. You know, the pattern recognition, the image recognition that you're talking about. Dr. Roper, when he was our acquisition chief in the Air Force, he was a big science fiction nerd, like all of us, quite frankly. And like the grail that he had in his mind was R2-D2 and Luke Skywalker going down the trench of the Death Star. And that R2-D2 had the ability to repair things or to gain up sensors or to gain things down right at the spot where Luke Skywalker needed that to be able to accomplish his mission. So the idea of connecting up the machine and the human is a really interesting research front for the Air Force, kind of in that vision of how science fiction inspires a little bit of reality. Has there been any work done on applying artificial intelligence to building air tasking orders? For example, figuring out where's the best place to place your tanker orbits? Our buddies over at Kessel Run way back when the Defense Innovation Board got a chance to travel around and see different things in the Air Force, really the Department of Defense. That was one of the things that they came about as well, is when they went to go visit the Combat Air Operations Center, they were appalled, quite frankly, that people were still scheduling things, you know, using pucks on a whiteboard to move things around. And I think it was Eric Schmidt, who was on the Defense Board at the time, looked and said, hey, I think there's something we can do about that. And that became kind of the genesis of the tanker planning tool that Kessel Run is very famous for. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, those things, again, the other example is weather. Weather is one of those things that, for instance, I could pull up a database now and I could tell you what the weather was at Edwards Air Force Base on June 3rd of 2009, because that data is archived, it's formatted correctly, and that's something very discreet that I can feed to a machine that can then use that, again, at advanced, well, really, it's just stats, right? It's stats with a large amount of data. You can use that to get much more accurate weather predictions, which really, really matters in the world of military operations. Because, I mean, weather has always been a huge factor 
for any of that stuff, dating all the way back to Alexander the Great, you know, Spartans and the 300 and that sort of thing. But that is another application of it that really matters for our combat operations, right? So you can use it for ATO, you can use it for tanker planning, you can use it for scheduling, you can use it for weather. I mean, a a whole variety of things. The, The main thing that people really need to learn, like if I could leave you with one thing, you know, for you and your audience, Ken, is the most important thing for AI to work or machine learning, right? Depending on which term that you want to use for that is data, right? And not just random data, very clean, highly formatted, and and a lot of applications, although, you know, hopefully in the future, we can get less and less about this. You need gigantic amounts of data, right? In the right format. So a lot of folks want to jump immediately to the solution. And what we found a lot, just kind of dealing with AI technologies is the first question that would come up is, where's your data? And is the data in a clean format that is highly formatted? And do you have lots of it, right? If you do, now you can start entertaining problem sets that are good for the machine to start getting after. If you don't, then essentially it's a pipe dream. Are you familiar with the Garmin autonomous system, autonomous landing system that's now being put into some high-end general aviation airplanes? Yeah, I've seen that in uh, Cirrus airplanes, mainly because uh, I'm trying to convince my wife to let me buy an airplane. And uh, one of the things she's most interested in is that auto land capability. But then when I show her the price tag for that airplane, uh, we start having a different conversation. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, (laughs) Is that the kind of technology that might make uh, sense, particularly in single-place Air Force aircraft? What I've learned is, and oftentimes the commercial sector will have a huge financial incentive to advance technology. This was kind of like an axiom of AFWorks when I was there, which was, hey, rather than develop technology specifically just for a military user, let's look for technologies that have global application to a whole host of folks. And as the military, we're just one of many customers because then we get the technology cheaper we also get a much more evolved product along the way. So when I see things, for instance, like a classic example is, you know, things like ForeFlight, iPads, those types of technologies, they were really kind of prototyped, if you will, in the world of commercial aviation. And now they've made their way into military applications as well. And Cirrus is one of a couple, I think, that are looking at this. When I saw the, hey, I can push a button and the airplane will immediately look for the closest runway it will make a call on the radio, it will set me up for final approach, and then it will stop me right in the middle of the runway and do all that completely hands off. That was pretty interesting technology that you go, yeah, I'm sure there's good applications there that we could use on the military side. What are some of the ethical and legal implications of artificial intelligence in a military application? They are gigantic. You know, this was something that we continue to spend a lot of time on here. Where do you start? There's so many ways of which to go. The ethical side, let's kind of start there. And for instance, China, it's widely known China is essentially a gigantic surveillance state and that they collect information on their citizens for a number of different applications and different hosts, right? One of the things that we were most concerned about is if you're a nation like China and you're collecting that information and you're storing it, can you use that also with which to target different racial groups to say, hey, these people don't have access to these things because as a centralized government, We consider them others, right? They're undesirables. And now I can use technology with which to go do that. I think the term, and I heard this, I think I read this in a strategic kind of document out there, open source, was technology for the perfection of dictatorships. And when I read that, I went, wow. I mean, this was the world that the Pol Pots and the Joseph Stalins of the world could always imagine that way. Because again, data very cleanly formatted, lots of it. And suddenly that opens up kind of a world of, even if you could do X, Y, or Z, is that the right thing with which to go do? One of the things that I've been greatly, greatly proud of and appreciative of to be in the United States is that as a military, especially, we wrestle with these sorts of things very openly. And we engender things like partnerships with academia and various different you know, technology forums, because we want that debate. And we want to be able to develop these technologies in the most ethical manner possible. Very different than, say, how other nations around the world would have done that and are doing it, quite frankly. The other classic example that comes up all the time was when researchers were trying to, again, in a bounded learning environment, right, expert kind of system, if you will, 
when you feed it pictures over and over again and say, this is a human being, again, the machine only knows the data that you gave it. And when we talked about earlier that the machines will pick up the biases of the trainers that gave it, it's 100% true. There's a classic example, and this came up over and over again, of the machine was fed pictures of Caucasian people, for instance, and it said, hey, this is a person, this is a person, this is a person. And the first data that it received of a person with brown skin, the machine didn't recognize it because everything it had been given and fed was of a certain type. And when it sees someone with brown skin, it immediately associated that. It said, um, ape, right? And it went, ooh, wow, that's not true, but we got to be very cautious of the data that we feed it. If you fed the machine hey, I want to be able to predict who could be the next president of the United States. And you fed it all of the data of every president that we've had up to this point. It would essentially say that a woman could not be president because all of the data set that we fed it was men, right? Over and over again. So it really triggered this very interesting and necessary debate of what things are we going to turn over to the machine? What do I trust the machine to do? How are we teaching it and what data sets are we providing it? Again, it gets back to the trustable AI portion of it. Because again, you get very, very quickly into deep ethical kind of questions when you start talking about gathering large amounts of data, feeding it to a machine and expecting it to kind of take over your cognitive thought and to make decisions for you. What we found is that we use it in extremely small, bounded kind of problem sets in which if it's wrong, It's not catastrophic. So it sounds like you, well, I shouldn't say just you, but the Air Force would be very reluctant, if not out and out prohibit, using artificial intelligence to make engagement and weapons release decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And the other way to think about that for your listeners as well is when you feel comfortable putting your family on a commercial airliner with no air crew on board. Maybe then, right, autonomy and AI, those types of technologies, maybe they've reached the level of maturity that we can feel comfortable with that. That's still long, 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 long way away. So instead, what you see is rather than getting to the point of like a weapons engagement or the release of weapons, right, to your term, you instead see parcels of that. Like you break down that kill chain where you, we're focusing on the very end of it, where there's a weapons release, right? Going all the way to you know a kinetic kill of some sort or some type of destruction. But you break that down and you go, well, did you ID it correctly? Was the information passed correctly, right? All those different steps that you would need to get all the way to the end where a weapons release decision has been made. That's where we start getting into, okay, are there problem sets there where an AI, right? A machine learning AI enabled kind of system Are there problem sets there that would be useful, but if it's wrong, it's not catastrophic, but it's helpful in terms of making that kill chain a little bit more streamlined? That's kind of the problem sets. That's where we're at right now. So if I could put words in your mouth, and you can tell me if they're the wrong words, when we look at the next generation of military aviation systems like this uh, NGAD, I guess it's called, Next Generation Air Dominance Fighter, or the remotely piloted counterparts of that, that there will still be humans in the loop, that they will not be totally autonomous killer robots. Yeah, I would say, one, the Air Force isn't interested in doing that. And frankly, the first country that developed a killer robot, believe it or not, was China via an armed quadcopter kind of thing. And we saw that and went, ooh, that's absolutely not the world that we would want to get towards. I look at it and I go, this gets to the science fiction. I mean, this is where you know movies like Terminator... <laughs> I think it probably, you know, kind of biased our mindset of what artificial intelligence, machine learning, and when you combine that with military, kind of where that ends up. You know, this gets to the point I was telling you a little bit earlier. There are a whole host of other things that are much more useful for that, that are far safer, and quite frankly, with the state of the technology, probably more appropriate for where we're at. One of the questions that we like to ask at Fighter Pilot Podcast is, what's your call sign and how did you get it? The call sign is uh, Laz, L-A-Z, and it came from Lazarus, which if you know a little bit of the biblical story of how Lazarus got his name, that actually tells you a lot about how I got my name. The very, very short kind of version of it is I was flying an F-15 in Alaska on a no kidding dark and stormy night where you didn't have visibility to the ground and all of my avionics in the airplane broke, especially the ones that tell you which way is up or down. And so I ended up in a spatially disoriented kind of situation. 
And I was lucky to save the airplane from hitting the ground, but I only had maybe about a second or so to spare before I would have hit the ground. Uh, so I got lucky. And so the people that were listening to me struggle with this on the radio, trying to recover the airplane, they would tell me stories of fighter pilots they had known that weren't quite so fortunate that got disoriented and then hit the ground and didn't survive. And so I got the call sign Lazarus, right, for coming back from the dead because there was a period of time they thought I was a goner. A lot of fighter pilots I've met, they don't like their call signs. I love it, mainly because it teaches me that, hey, every day is a gift. And, you know, watch your mental attitude because, you know, no matter how bad things are, it was never as bad as what it was for me in that cockpit that night, you know, as a young lieutenant flying in Alaska. So you lost your primary attitude reference on a dork and stormy night? Yep. Yeah. I lost the attitude. I lost the head. Well, the heads up display froze and the attitude indicator froze, right? So they were in op, but looked like they were working, which made it even worse. It made that illusion Very, very hard to overcome because when you can't see the ground, they tell you, you know, trust your instruments. And when I looked at my instruments, my instruments were bad. When your inner ear starts playing with you, even though you think you're in a left hand turn in reality, you could be completely upside down based on what your inner ear is telling you. So it was very, very difficult to overcome that sense of what the actual airplane attitude really was. The only thing I had going for me was a little standby gauge that was still working, not tied to the rest of the systems. And I ended up recovering off of that. But if that weren't there and I had delayed my decision more than a second, then we wouldn't be having this talk. Wow. That's quite a story. Colonel Gordon, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise and experience with a really fascinating topic. I think that uh, it's going to be quite a thing to see where this field evolves and how it applies to military aviation in the future. Ken, I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for taking the time out with me today. Uh, It's been fun. And thanks for letting me be on your podcast. Have a good one. All right. Well, gosh, big thanks again to Colonel Gordon for taking the time to help us out. And Ken, nice job with the interview there. That was, again, really just amazing. Always a pleasure to contribute to the Fighter Pilot Podcast community. All right. So, Ken, forget Skynet. You're just telling me. AI is math. I mean, I was a math major in college. I took statistics. So that's it. AI is math. Well, that's what Colonel Gordon to some (laughs) extent says. I mean, I think this technology is not magic and it's not quite true intelligence as we humans have it. It's subject to garbage in, garbage out. I thought his example of facial recognition software making a rather basic mistake was a good example of the limitations of this technology. Why do you think that if the case that Elon Musk apparently is so afraid of AI. I think he was on Joe Rogan. I haven't read or seen any of his comments, but I'm wondering why he's afraid of it without knowing what AI was very well. I just assumed it was he was afraid of Skynet, but I wonder if it's maybe that he's afraid of big data and people abusing it. I don't know what he's thinking, but I have a guess that he fears, and Colonel Gordon hit upon this, that AI can be used to create a pervasive surveillance system that could be exploited for oppressive purposes. You know, mm-hmm. Imagine if all the data from your medical records and your social media and your email and your phone and your credit cards and your bank accounts and your car navigation system and everybody with whom you interacted was being constantly analyzed and your access to the financial system and other things could be restricted or eliminated if you didn't meet the approval of the regime. Mm-hmm. AI enables that stuff. In fact, that's what's happening in China right now. Yeah. I think that's something to be afraid of. So, but to be clear, it's being afraid of the people abusing it, not necessarily being afraid of the technology itself. I think so. I think it's like any other weapon, if you will, it's an inanimate object. Right. And just as the weapons that we talk about on this show can be used to protect or they can be used to uh, create misery and and, uh, wreckage. Well, that's true. I mean, obviously, there's a big debate in America all the time about firearms. I mean, sitting on the table, they're harmless, but in the wrong hands, they can do a lot of damage. All right, Kent, you have to help me out here. Kessel Run. Is that something from Star Wars? I feel like I should know this. It's named after that. I did a little bit of research on that. The Air Force (laughs) has something called the Life Cycle Management Center, which is the part of the Air Force Material Command that buys stuff. Okay. It's their Detachment 12. And of course, it's nicknamed after the Star Wars thing. And I looked it up, and their missions to revolutionaries, the Air Force software acquisition process, and quickly, and here's the quote, and responsibly deliver combat capabilities. So if you look over the website, they seem to focus on command and control systems using what's called agile software development. Hmm. You know, it's an attempt to move away from, you know, what I'll call big Air Force, big bureaucracy. I see. It certainly is a noble thing. We'll have to see whether that works. 
Another term he threw out that I felt like I should know, but I wasn't quite sure was AFWorks or AFWorks, something like that. AFWorks. AFWorks is kind of like a, you know, a spin on the Skunk Works. It's a branch of the Air Force Research Laboratory. Again, it's meant to develop new ideas that big Air Force's bureaucracy would probably step all over or just ignore. But they've tried to come up with a shop, if you will, where people can uh, develop interesting ideas. Okay. All right, Ken. So in the grand scheme of things, was there one big takeaway here? I mean, uh, the colonel was obviously generous with his time. He's a busy gentleman. He had to uh, head off before we could really drag it out for a long time. But what's the bottom line? What does this mean for air combat now and in the future, do you think? I think that AI is going to be pervasive in future air combat. Although I don't think, it's not that people go away, but here's just some examples that I've been seeing. Mm -hmm. There's an article in the current issue of Aviation Week and Space Technology, which is about how the Air Force is going to use AI and big data to revolutionize maintenance and logistics. Hmm. Because there's something called prognostic health. You know, one way to maintain an aircraft is to just fix something when it breaks. But of course, it breaks, and then you've got a broken airplane. Another way is to say, well, we're going to get ahead of that and we're going to fix things, replace things, say, based on calendars or flight hours or landings or something like that. But then you're replacing stuff that may have useful life left. And remember, every time you mess with something, you can break it worse. If you have sensors, let's say temperature and vibration and things like that on components, let's say wheels and brakes and air cycle machines... If you've got sensors on them, then you can use AI to develop patterns, to look at patterns. And you can say, okay, this break is fine. Oh, okay, it looks like this break is coming up on the end of its life. So now's when we're going to replace the break. We're not just going to do it because we've had so many landings or so many flight hours. And so, you know, what you could get out of prognostic health management, which is really based on AI, is just in time maintenance that gives you both more reliable systems and lower support costs. So I think that's a huge thing. And there's a really good article, as I said, in Aviation Week about that. I think another thing that's interesting, and this is pretty radical, I don't know if you've been following what the DARP has been working on. They had a um, experiment where they basically had designers try to develop artificial intelligence fighter pilots. And then they did a simulated dogfight against real fighter pilots in the simulator. Yeah, we talked about that on one of the episodes. Yeah, I think we did. So why that, you know, who knows where that goes? And then I think that another really key area is going to be in, in ISR, in intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, because you can put huge amounts of data in there and start to tease out patterns. So for example, in Ukraine right now, we're seeing that small groups of infantry with missiles can be extremely effective. For one thing, they're mm-hmm. hard to find. But imagine that you had remote piloted airplanes flying all over the place with all kinds of sensors. Then all that data from all these aircraft was being funneled into, a, if you will, a big data pool. And then you had AI type algorithms looking through there. You might be able to pull out who are the people with missiles and attack them with artillery or with air power. That ability to sift out, if you will, needles out of haystacks could be extremely important in the uh, ISR world. So I think this is going to be very big stuff. Not only that, I think it's something we're going to continue discussing here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast and elsewhere because I don't think it's going away and it's going to be more prevalent in the different things that we talk about. And I think we're going to revisit it. Oh, I think so. This is big stuff. And I think there are going to be a lot of interesting people we can talk to. Great. Thanks again, Ken, for facilitating that interview. And we can begin to transition to the end state here. I want to thank our new Patreon strike lead, Brian Bills. And we want to remind everyone that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components or its contractors. Now, Ken, before we go, last time we heard from you, you had a, I think it was a B1 book coming out. How's that going? It's been out, and I've gotten really nice feedback on the book. Thank you for asking. Okay. In fact, the first shipment sold out already, so we have more on the way for the publisher. Next month, I'm going to be the guest speaker at the B1 Bomber Association reunion. Nice. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm also going to be um, presenting to my old squadron, Edwards Air Force Base, about the history of the B1. All right. So that'll be a fun thing to do. I think when we first talked with you about it, it was coming out in the UK, but not here, so I assume it's out pretty much everywhere now? Yeah, it came out in the US in uh, late March. 
Okay. It's definitely available or it's available for order. It's pretty close to being sold out, but there are more coming. Good. Well, we can try to put a link to one of them on our shop page on the website here, which is just a convenient place for you to find it. And then we get a few pennies on every book we sell. So, you know, enough snowflakes make a blizzard. All right, cool. Hey, before you go though, what else do you have in store for us? You've been a great help. And when you do an interview, it uh, gives me a little white space to do other things. So what else you got in store? Well, I'm working on an episode about flight control systems and how they work. Um, we uh, uh-huh. lined up a uh, retired Air Force test pilot who has some really interesting expertise and experiences. After that, I'm trying to arrange an episode on flight testing the B-2 Spirit. Ooh. Maybe a couple episodes on interesting things that are happening at Edwards Air Force Base today. Uh-huh. You know, I like to get feedback from our listeners and the Patreon supporters because if they like what I'm doing, I'll do more of it. And if they don't like it, then we'll have to change. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Yeah. Patreon's a good place for the folks that support the show. And then of course, uh, YouTube and Facebook, as we always either put the episodes up or at least announce them, please let us know what you like or don't like, and we'll march forward accordingly. So sounds good, Ken. Well, appreciate all your help. And uh, thanks for doing this one today. Thanks again. Well, for everyone else, we are heading into May, and that means Top Gun Maverick is just that much closer. Hopefully, the world seems to be opening up. So we're going to dedicate May and part of June to Top Gun Month. But this year, 2022, also marks the 40th anniversary of the Falkland Islands War, or conflict, whatever you want to call it. We're going to call it a war. And so I've got a little homework for you all. If you have not done so already, I highly recommend you go read Roland White's outstanding book, Carrier 809. It's only 450 pages. So that's what, 45 pages a day between now and then? We're going to feature a former squadron commander next time who is heavily featured in that book. And you might remember we also did a short video with Roland White promoting the Harrier 809. So you may want to go check that one out again. Until then, thanks for tuning in. Take care, be well, and thanks for joining us here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening.